It's the idea of the birth of consciousness. How do we become conscious, full stop, and then conscious of us, the birth of the subject and of our body? This uh, question could also be connected to uh, uh, what uh, Catherine said this morning. When does a set of cells become aware of itself? And how? And to, obviously there's no definitive answer. If I had that, it would be probably the Nobel Prize for medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, an hypothesis uh, that is interesting to look at is what uh, precisely Jean Berges uh, described as what he called the functioning of body functions. And that there is a, a sort of, as we're going to see, a sort of reflexing process, reflexive process, sorry, that leads probably to being aware. And if you touch uh, uh, the lips of, of a newborn baby, uh, they, they turn their head and they, they, they start to, to move actually towards something. They, they move in anticipation, not only of the breast, but of something else. And the sensorial message, the touching, which is a message, uh, starts a motor response, which in itself anticipates the presence of an object and the use of an object. In other words, this reflex leads the baby toward thinking of what is not happening. In this case, suckling. It might happen and it connects with desire and need. And it should happen at some point, even in the absence of the object, and can be helped by an act turning the head in the right direction and opening the mouth. So, this thinking can only occur if the subject reflects upon what is happening. You, you need an element of reflective thinking. Otherwise, it would be just a meaningless, almost a parasitic muscular contraction. I touch, I turn, but I don't do anything with that. It's far more uh, in the baby. The functioning of the body is automatic, programmed, and in some ways, bombard the psyche with messages. And what's interesting is that probably the structure of the message itself contain the possibility of an hypothesis. So the structure of the message makes me start to think about what I'm going to do, even before I have done it for the first time. And that's a, a, a very interesting fact. Now, Despite the, uh, the presence of the same sort of reflex in animals, this sort of endorsing of an hypothesis by the subject does not happen in, in uh, even most primates and probably even less in uh, other animals. So what's the difference? And as it's been already mentioned, uh, there's two things that makes a great difference in human beings. The first one is our status as speaking beings, language, and the second is the prematurity uh, of human babies. It's been, again, already mentioned, but the Winnicottian uh, statement, there is no such thing as a baby, that means there must be a mother somewhere, um, points out the reality of the baby's dependence on another to survive and to thrive. So it's the mother who is going to be engaged in a complex game of interaction which exposes the baby to the symbolic realm through the mother's thinking and her submission to language. So language is already present because it's already present in the mother. For, uh, in, in the, the Lacanian model, the baby is born with the human potential of thinking and does, from the very start, display some very early form of thinking, call it proto-thinking or, or whatever, but it forms concept and hypothesis from the earliest days and probably even before being born. Now, that uh, sometimes people uh, f have a few difficulties with thinking that so young creatures can uh, make hypotheses. And uh, what's interesting is that in a completely different field, which is that of experimental psychology, some colleagues at uh, UCL and uh, Birkbeck and University of London have looked at quite young babies and have done some experiment with babies where they, they see how they react. And there's a research by Cibra, C-S-I-B-R-A, and, col and, and colleagues showed that nine-month-old uh, babies 
and I quote, invoke a psychological principle, namely the principle of rational action to interpret behavior as goal-directed action. So it's a bit of a long sentence, but in other words, they anticipate actions, they understand the, uh, the, the in a way, the, um, uh, what, is, what may happen to, it's a, there's a big blob and a small blob and all sorts of things happen and you see the babies reacting in a way that shows that they, they anticipate that the small blob, for example, is going to be damaged by the big one and the, the small one doesn't seem to react at nine months. So an anticipation of, of, of uh, action and goals and reaction. So it's all there now, in a way it's been, probably clinicians knew it, but now it's been demonstrated that they can do that interesting field uh, is actually anorexia nervosa where uh, you see a subject trying desperately to make the flesh disappear. The body should be an image of perfection, image and words without flesh. As long as you've not reached that state, you're, you're, you're losing. That's the battle. So the imaginary and the symbolic, images and words, are knotted together without any real. So you try to knot together the image and the words, but there is, there, there's no flesh, there's no real. The triumph of the mind of a matter, that, that is really the, the challenge. I want to be skinny, says a patient. But you have to be, if you work with young people, they will teach you that skinny does not mean slim. It doesn't mean svelte or fit. Skinny is something magical that would bring me happiness. And usually, it, is, it can be approached through number. It's purely symbolic. For example, size 8 is absolutely horrible. Size 6 would already be not too bad. But if only I could be a size 4, that would be fantastic. And, and they tell you usually, you know, the Americans call it size 0. <laughs> and size 0 is exactly that. I want to be size zero. Yeah. So in the same way, in a slightly different way, if you ask an uh, anorexic patient what their target, they tell you, you know, I'm weighing out of 54 kilos and it's, uh, I know that at, at 40 I would be more happy, but 34 I would be perfectly well. And usually you, you can say at 34 you would be perfectly dead. But, uh, <laughs> but no, they, they, that's, they, they, can't, they can't get that. So the aim would be not to have flesh, and the body sensation are therefore experienced as painfully uh, because, because they are. They remind you that as long as you feel, you have a body. So uh, you know, I eat a uh, uh, tiny bit, and I say, oh, I'm so bloated, I'm so full. I'm thinking, what? Uh, it's, it's not possible. But what is actually what they are saying is I feel something, and as long as I feel something, it's not acceptable. It is quite possible that the failure of a transitivist relationship with the mother is an important factor in the development of that sort of illness. For example, the, the fact that uh, uh, both ADHD and uh, uh, anorexia, the mother I either does not make hypothesis or the child refuses to accept the mother's to reading of the knowledge which is in themselves. In both cases, the child cannot identify with this knowledge, which is a state of the body, and they remain oblivious to their dangerous thinness, for example, or their agitation. And in the case of uh, anorexia, without being deluded, without even being oppositional, it's very important because you, you wonder how, how is it that you don't see the state you're in? Well, without being psychotic, because actually this is not red. Now, the uh, understanding of what holds the body together has obvious practical consequences for clinicians, both in the understanding of pathological manifestation, but also in uh, choosing the direction of therapeutic treatment, of, and to try to understand, in that sort of cases, how the therapist is going to very often be put in the position of a transitivist mother, that you're going to have to do that job that was not done and which is probably a lot of what happened uh, in, in, the, in the Maison Verte uh, work.